More than anyone else, the spirit of resistance to this control has been Fannie Lou Hamer. At the 1964 Democratic Convention, Mrs. Hamer was a leader of the attempt to unseat the regular Democratic delegation from Mississippi. Mississippi is still a very rough place, you know. Um, people is not just walking up like they used to do in the past, walking out, you know, shooting a man down or getting maybe two or three hundred people carrying you out and lynching you, but it's, it's in a most settled way. Um, you know, they can let you starve to death, not give you jobs. These are some of the things that's happening right now in Mississippi. See, Mississippi is not actually Mississippi's problem. Mississippi is America's problem. Because if America wanted to do something about what has been going on Mississippi, it could have stopped by now. It wouldn't have been in the past few years. 40, uh, between 40 and 50 churches bombed and burned. You see, and this, this, you know, this lead me to say, you know, all of the burning and bombing that was done to us and the houses, nobody never said too much about that and nothing was done. But let something be burned, you know, by a black man. And then, my God, you know, you see, the flag is is drinks with our blood because you see so many of our ancestors was killed because we have never accepted slavery we had to live on it but we've never wanted it so we know that this flag is drinks with our blood so what the young people are saying now give us a chance to be young men respected as a man as we know, this country was built on the black backs of black people across this country. And if we don't have it, you ain't going to have it either, because we're going to tear it up. That's what they're saying. And people ought to understand that. I, I don't see why they don't understand that. They know what they've done to us. All across this country, they know what they've done to us. This country is desperately sick. And man is on the critical list. I really don't know where we go from here. How much would you estimate is denied to poor people uh, by these illegal and arbitrary practices of welfare department? Uh, you, you estimate that the welfare is, uh, pays, I guess, uh, seven billion, six, seven billion dollars uh, a year in benefits. Uh, how much would you say is denied uh, by these illegal practices? The research that we've done would suggest that the American public welfare system is only expending half of what it should be expending if it were reaching all of the people who are eligible under existing statutes. So we think welfare costs should probably double. So there should be, peop poor people are being cheated out of another six or seven billion six dollars, or seven a, year billion across, dollars a year across the country. Just on minimum standards, just on household furnishings and heavy clothing in New York City, they're being cheated out of 50, 50 million dollars this year, just in that one city. And would you say that the, uh, would you say that uh, we know that residence laws are being knocked down? Uh, the welfare rights movement and the lawyers are challenging uh, man in the house rules and other kinds of requirements restricting. This, I presume, would be uh, additional people who could become eligible uh, for additional money if these were, uh, if these were challenged. Yes, that would, that would raise the cost even more. Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. Richard Cloward was a larger-than-life figure for many people. A major influence straddling the professions of social work and sociology, he thought of himself as a social scientist and as a social work community organizer. He was a critically acclaimed scholar, a seminal thinker and theoretician, influential teacher, eloquent speaker, and always an activist. As Dick put it, my organizing activities can be summed up as trying to help 
poor people gain access to safety net benefits and to help them get on the voter registration rolls as a way of defending their rights to those benefits. Along with his wife and professional partner, Francis Fox Piven, they co-authored numerous influential articles and books, including the classics, Regulating the Poor, The Functions of Public Welfare, and Poor People's Movements, Why They Succeed, How They Fail. Our guest today on The Radical Imagination is Joshua Miller, who conducted a series of three separate interviews with Dick during the summer of 2000, a year before his passing. Josh masterfully facilitated a narrative process where Dick could, in his own words, relate the history of his career, discuss his seminal ideas, I do what I write about, and I write about what I do, describe his partnership with Francis, we work together, we think together, we act together, and reflect on the meaning of his professional experience, create a crisis, and pray. Josh's work published in Reflections Magazine and the Journal of Community Practice are masterpieces that have set down for the historical record a treasure trove of information. They're sources of inspiration for generations to come who didn't have the honor, joy, and as Dick would put it, the opportunity of knowing him personally. Josh has been a professor at Smith College School for Social Work for close to 30 years, where his work and focus has been on the impact of historical, structural, and interpersonal racism and helping individuals and communities recover from major disasters. His father, Irving Miller, was a renowned professor at Columbia University School of Social Work, where he was one of Dick's close friends, colleague, and confidants. Josh, it is so great and such a blessing to have you here and to, uh, I'm so powerfully moved by your interviews and bringing back some of the memories that I had with Richard. And um, I think it's so important uh, to do this show and for the new generation to, to appreciate and to get to know Dick as, as we did. And, and, and just before I, we, we get started formally, uh, I, last week, I had a show with Elizabeth Hinton and Jonathan Hartgrove, Wilson Hartgrove. Uh, Jonathan, as you probably know, works with Reverend Barber, Poor People's Campaign, co-authored a book, Third Reconstruction, with him. Elizabeth uh, just came out with a book, America on Fire. Uh, these are the newer generation. And when I mentioned, when I mentioned um, Richard's name, the first thing out of Elizabeth's mouth was wow that I had worked with him and I had known him and so on and Jonathan has we did a show with Francis as well and they use poor people's movement uh, I'm sorry yeah poor people's movement in the poor people's campaign with Reverend Barber so these are seminal thinkers activists and uh, I'm so glad we can share your wonderful work with them and uh, and writings so thank you so much for being here Oh, well, thank you, Jim, and, and thank you for that gracious introduction. And um, I feel so privileged that I had a chance to interview Richard, and it was just, you know, a year before he died. Um, and he's had such an impact on me and you and so many people and the field, and just how we think about poverty, dissensus, uh, political power, and so many other things. So thank you for inviting me, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Where to begin? There is so much to talk about. Um, Richard's parents, right? He, there was an influence from both sides there. His mother was an artist and an activist in the women's movement. Uh, his father was a radical Baptist minister. So there is this um, spiritual progressive force and artistic and activist force from the very beginning there um but how did richard get involved in sociology and social work uh you, one of the uh, beginnings of your uh in one of your beginning of the interview you talked about him as the accidental criminologist how did that come about 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, and you know, I had known Richard all my life. And, um, and there was so much I didn't know about him because it wasn't like he was very um, loquacious or forthcoming about himself. He liked to talk, in my experience, liked to talk about politics, issues, uh, power, and how to achieve goals. So, you know, I called it the accidental sociologist because a lot of this from what Richard shared with me came from having been in the Navy and then during the Korean War, um, I think he was, he re reconscripted, I'm not sure what the term is, but he worked as a medical social worker um, in a prison in, Pen in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Right. And um, he already had studied, I believe, with Robert Merton and the PhD program in, at Columbia University. Um, I might have my time frame wrong, but that's what I recall. And he realized that Robert Merton's theory of deviance and anomie was just like one half. It was almost like Freud discovering that there's an unconscious as opposed to just what we're consciously thinking. And this was like a sociological version of that because he realized when he was working in this prison that um, there's a concrete historical social reality and it shapes what people can do, but whether it's gangs in neighborhoods or prisoners in prisons, people figure out what the power structure is. They're aware of it, they're living it, they're embedded in it. And so they in turn develop their own skills, their own hierarchy, their own uh, roles within that. And that affects their lives. Like one of the examples he gave was, um, if, if you're in a neighborhood where there are a lot of organized, there's a lot of organized crime, they, that neighborhood, the older folks who have a vested interest in how it's being run, don't wanna have gangs that are fighting with one another right. and bringing in the police and right. drawing attention to one another. And yet in another neighborhood where the um, issues are very much about territory and uh, establishing oneself, then fighting might be a part of how gangs operated. So anyway, he had all these insights, but it really very much from at least my understanding from what he shared with me came from this experience in this prison, coupled with his thinking about Merton's theory of deviance anatomy. Right. It, it, when did you first, now your, your father knew him well, so as a as a kid, you knew him. Did you take courses from him at all or? No, I never did. No, never I, ne did. I never went to Columbia. It, it, it was a life course, you know, like. Life course, again, okay, even better, even better. He was not a big uh, talker, so it wasn't right. like he would sit me down and talk to me. But, um, you know, I read a lot of his things and he was like a model. A lot of times it's, it's not necessarily what a person says, it's who they are. And he was one of those people I really looked up to and kind of idealized, particularly when I was younger. Same here. Same here. Um, now, as you interviewed him too, I mean, he admits himself, he really didn't go to college. So it was, it was he, 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 he did work in the Navy, uh, college credits. Then he, I believe he went to the social work school, Columbia Social Work School in 1949 and 50, got his degree there. Also uh, doing work in sociology as well. And then finally finishing his dissertation in 1959, based on what you've been describing here as his insights into prison cult, social structure, theory of illegitimate opportunities and so on. And then his work with Merton. So um, it's interesting. I mean, he sort of fell into this in a way, uh, well, falling into it is not the word, uh, the way I want to, uh, you know, caption it here, but, but probably because of his influence with his parents. He wanted to do something social. I mean, he was originally trained as an engineer, I believe. So, mm -hmm. and, and there was so much going on at the time. And so social work seemed like a, a logical um, school for him to go to, especially after his experience at this prison uh, setting where uh, he, he was the psychiatric, the head psychiatric social worker. You know, he was really proud of his social work 
background yeah. of being part of the social work profession. Yes. He so easily could have been a, a very famous sociologist and stayed within that framework and that parameter. And, and it's really interesting. He was describing to me um, when he was trying to get into the Columbia School for Social Work and how he almost didn't get in because uh, he was not seen as being psychoanalytic enough exactly, and self-reflective about the unconscious sufficiently. And he, he, and almost he, never, he never got out. He almost didn't get out either. Then he had trouble there as well, right? With some of the- Yes, the he did. Yes. And, and again, it was a very different scene back then, at least yeah. in many ways. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, one of the things that, that really struck me about Richard, which relates to what you're talking about, Jim, is that incredibly intelligent, incredibly sensitive, even though he didn't necessarily show that side of himself, but he really felt things passionately um, and was hurt by injustice uh, when he encountered it. And so I think that he eventually migrated to a field, sociology and social work, that fit his passions, his political beliefs, and where he felt like he could really make a difference, which I think he did. But the other thing that really struck me about Richard, a lot of things have struck me about Richard, but one is that um, he was, he didn't just hold on to an idea. If he would test it and he would uh, revise it, if his experiences showed him that the idea wasn't working. And that was throughout his career with Human Serve when he was registering voters. Um, and, be, and at the beginning when he was doing mobilization for youth, and then the other thing is just how fortunate he was to have met Francis Fox Piven and for, the, for two people to have a collaboration like that and to be able to take each other to higher levels and greater depths and to be talking about their work all the time. Um, I've never had that experience. You know, I have a wife and I have colleagues who I collaborate with. And so I, you know, I, it's more compartmentalized. And I just feel like that was so special, certainly for him and how he described that to me. Um, so I think that even if he didn't have the formal background, he, even when he, he was living in Rochester, he set up a settlement house with Mark Battle, who became, I think, the president of the National Association of Social Workers. So he already, and, and as you mentioned, his, both his parents were social activists. And so he, you know, inculcated a lot of their values. But I, I, I think that, uh, I don't know, it's, it, it's always hard to know, do we find the career that fits us or do we just kind of get stuck in it and we didn't realize it? I think he found what was his path and his passion. True, and, and to, to just uh, agree with some of the, your observations there, I um, found him, I, I didn't realize how shy he really was. And I tend to be, believe it or not, fairly shy myself. So it took me a while before I really had uh, the courage to come in and sit down with him and uh, confide with him. And one of the things I confided in with him is I really didn't like. I was a I was a caseworker. I was at the I was at the social work school at, at the time. This was in uh, sixty nine and seventy uh, sixty yeah summer 68 and falls and i didn't like it and i just i took his course of deviant behavior i finished the year and i came in there and i said look i am really not happy and i really don't know what to do and he said i understand i wasn't very happy here either and anyway we talked about it and i moved into sociology and so on so he's he was extremely sensitive and um and, and again, like you say, he wasn't living in some fantasy world. He lived, he, he, what he observed, he wrote about and backed it up and refined it. It wasn't about some grand theory that he tried to apply to a world out there. Um, but, he, but he also uh, had excellent, excellent tutelage uh, with Merton for several years. And um, so he went through the rigors of being a PhD student under Merton and others and so on. So, uh, but, but again, he never, um, he never lost sight of what was really important. He never got caught up 
in elite circles. It was it was always his concern with the poor, the disenfranchised, and encouraging both social workers and sociology sociologists to to follow that lead and not to be so involved in their careerism and grants and so on. And uh, so, yeah, go ahead. No, he hated that stuff. You know, he yeah. hated a lot of what academia requires people to do, going to faculty meetings, applying for grants, um, and basically towing the line with what is currently in vogue theoretically. So, you know, he, he and Francis were really complex thinkers, Francis still is, and so, you know, the, the breadth and range of what they were able to digest, metabolize, and take in was extraordinary. And yet they could distill it down into very simple ideas, which is important when you're doing organizing, as you well know. You Absolutely. can't keep it too complicated. Absolutely. So to hold both of those, I was really impressed with. And then the, the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, Richard and Francis had so much conflict they were really not afraid to go toe to toe and to uh, and in fact, that was part of their theory of activism, which was the role of conflict and dissensus. And given the fact that he was a shy person, a sensitive person, and I also am a, a somewhat shy person, I can really understand how painful that must have been, how hard that must have been to right. always feel embattled whether that was with the mayor of New York or the head of human services or the dean of Columbia or um, yeah, Robert yeah. Merton or the people yeah. at Brandeis when Richard was trying to get tenure, to constantly be um, involved in a um, contentious kind of process is, is not easy. It takes yeah, its toll. Yeah, yeah. I think it took its toll on him. You know, I remember in class saying that when he would get into discussions and debates, and uh, with, with students were asking questions. And then he caught himself and he said, you know, please don't be cowed here. This is just my combative nature from, from what I've been through. So, and then he, he calmed down and everybody sort of relaxed and you relate to him. Before we get back to Francis and, 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 and Dick, let's briefly mention about, uh, mention of, about your father and how close they were. And, um, Richard, I think you had this in the interview, or, or I, I did uh, an interview with uh, Francis. Anyway, this came out, and and that Dick would listen to your father's summaries of the various uh, departmental <laughs> meetings, and then he said, "Well, great, Irving has just told me everything I need to know. I don't need to go." And of course, that was just, just so wonderful because he he couldn't he couldn't be bothered with this stuff. I mean, uh, because of some, you know, but, but your father in so many ways was an ally and, and such a wonderful friend. And I, I, oh, yeah. I, I think they really loved one another. And, Absolutely. Um, and uh, it's interesting. My father was profoundly visually handicapped or disabled. And um, so he couldn't drive. And so Richard and he carpooled, Richard would pick him up and, um, and take him into Columbia. And you're absolutely right. My father was extremely extroverted, talked all the time. Yeah. I think I mentioned in, you know, before my interviews that when I rode in with Richard, uh, we didn't say a word to one another because we were both fairly introverted. So anyway, my, I'm sure my father was talking all the time and my father would give blow by blow descriptions of what happened in a faculty meeting with also editorials. And right. since they respected one another, I'm sure Richard kind of took uh, what he was saying as, well, this is probably what really happened, or this is the important part of what happened. And I think they mutually looked up to one another. And it was, you know, I remember when Richard spoke at my father's funeral, and which was only actually a few months before Richard died, and I didn't realize how close the end was for him. Um, he called him the Solomon of the School of Social Work. Um, and he spoke for one minute. He was very clear he wasn't going to speak for longer than that. But uh, I think they both admired each other each other's passion, intellect, and their sense of ethics. They both had really strong moral compasses. And when you meet somebody who shares that with you, that's a really special thing. And you can really trust the person then because you know that their intentions are good. 
um, and and that their goals are very similar to your own. But I, if I could just tell you one very quick story about something that happened with Richard and my father. Um, I was going to Clark University as an undergraduate, and I invited Richard to speak there. And he said he wouldn't come up without my father coming up as well. So they came up together, and, um, and it was during the day, and Richard wanted to go into the bar of his hotel and have a drink. And um, it was really dark in there. And uh, I came in late, but my friend was there with Richard before I came in. And also my father came in late. So my father being visually handicapped, walks into this dark bar mm. and he starts bumping into things. He's, he might've knocked a chair over and the bartender yells, mm. hey there, buddy, you've already had too much. You can't come in here. And Richard quietly knocked his drink over and the bartender had to come running over with his towel and was, you know, mopping it up. And Richard said very quietly to him, he's blind. Don't ever do that again. Wow. And the bartender, of course, you know, retracted and backed up. My father never even knew it happened. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he, he never took credit for things like uh, that. He just did it. Did Right. Right. I remember he also spoke uh, when I in class of a, of a classic work. I forget the author right now. The Making of Blind Men, and mm -hmm. uh, he referenced how the labeling process created the stigmatization and and sense that you're in, incapable of doing very much and so on. So he he related to so many people at that level too of whatever uh, struggles we were having. Um. Let's try to bring us up to date here with Francis and, and Richard. They met in mobilization for youth. And I think if you asked them this wonderful question, um, what would happen if you hadn't met Francis? And uh, remember how he responded? As, as I recall, I think how he responded was that, um, you know, I would not have achieved all that I achieved. I would not, that I would not have really come to so many of the ideas that I eventually contributed to right. and that they thought so much alike and that he listened to her, even though he had much more power and status when they first met, um, he was really open to learning from her at that point. I don't know if I left anything out on that, Joe. No, 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 that's true. He was the research director for mobilization for youth. Maybe we can set that. Yeah, uh, that down so people understand. So that was uh, 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 based on his book. Bobby Kennedy became interested, and this was the foundation for the War on Poverty programs. Okay, and then Francis was hired to work there. I think by Lloyd Olin, who knew yes. her and who was also a colleague and, and, and friend of, uh, of Richard. And they began, as you say, they began. Well, she comes out of. Uh, the planning school, University of Chicago. She's right. not formally a political scientist, although she's thought of in that sense. So yeah, so they combined that that those their backgrounds and their, as you say, their the moral integrity, and as you put it in the um, in the interview too, Francis comes from working class Jewish communist background, and and Richard more from uh, you know a, a white a white Anglo Saxon Protestant. Um, um, populist revolutionary radical tradition. So they they merge and mixed, and as you know, it's very very difficult. Marriage is difficult anyway, but I mean, uh, for them to become the sort of partners in life, and 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 their intellectual endeavors, their activism is simply mind blowing. Yeah, it really is. I mean, what's really important is that that originally mobilization for youth was set up as an anti-gang initiative yeah and again richard was so much the right person for that given his work and he and other people who were working in it and there were a lot of really great people who were working in mobilization for youth and francis realized that this is more about poverty uh, and and part of their realization as richard described it is that they were listening to people in the community and people in the community were saying, this is not just about gangs and dealing with gangs. This is a much, much bigger pro problem. I think what really struck me, and Francis was actually there when we had this part of the interview, 
was again the difference in their uh, power, status, economic, and professional security. And you know, Francis, I think, was a single parent at this time, and Richard was already an established sociologist. And um, and how Richard really saw Francis as an equal, if not a superior, and um, and really did not feel like he had to teach her. Maybe he did initially, I don't know, but mm -hmm. certainly it quickly evolved to a genuine partnership. And we have yeah. to go back to what it was like in the 60s and the misogyny and the sexism um, that was, you know, that would just be completely unacceptable today. It was really a lot less common for a white male professor with privilege and a PhD to be that open to an egalitarian relationship um, with a younger woman who, um, you know, on paper had not achieved as much. So I really was always struck by that. And the other thing is that Richard and Francis, unlike a lot of social workers at the time, they brought in not just class, but also race. And they really were looking at the fact that um, when we're talking about like New York City and big cities in the United States, and we're talking about poverty, you can't do that without bringing in the process and history of racism and the dynamics of that. And they had many colleagues of color, particularly black African-American colleagues, which again was not true of a lot of people who, who they were hanging out with in their professional cohort. Um, and because they were in the community and they did that together and they had a comfort level with that and an ability to do that, which again, people would say, well, of course you needed to do that. And that's what people should do. But going back to the sixties, that was highly unusual. Absolutely, absolutely. I think our opening clip was with Fannie Lou Hamer, Welfare Rights, and the incredible work uh, that Richard and Fran did with that and, and so on. But let's work our way up to that. So mobilization for youth, as you point out, becomes this anti-poverty program. Um, and it, it boils down to money. I mean, basic... Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, too, because I know when Richard always pointed out that he didn't think he was that revolutionary, that they were that revolutionary. Their strategies, their tactics, the means might have been disrupting the system, but they were not necessarily trying to totally create a, a new a new world here, a new system, in a sense. They borrowed, certainly from the dialectical paradigm of Marx, but I don't think they really consider themselves died in the wool true Marxists, correct? Right. No, I don't think so. And again, I really would love to hear what Francis would say about that. Right. But um, I think what they came to together at that time at Mobilization for Youth was a recognition of power and powerlessness. And that that had been missing from a lot of discussions about poverty, um, about delinquency and opportunity, all of the work that they had done. And they wrote a, a bunch of seminal articles, both alone and together for the nation, that really started looking at this both historically, structurally and systemically, and bringing in the issue of power and powerlessness. And again, that fit with Richard's theory, which is like, you only have the power to change certain things. What do you have the power to change? Well, one thing that people had the power to change was to bankrupt the welfare system. And at the same time, to put money in people's pockets so that people got were able to receive what they deserved and were eligible for. And that, to me, actually, I thought that was pretty revolutionary. The thought that uh, there are these bureaucracies like the New York City public welfare system that don't tell people what their rights are. Even the workers don't know what it is that people are eligible for. Therefore, people are not getting what they deserve and then when budgeting goes along, people, the budget is kept at a very low level. Um, so the reverberations from something as simple, again, that complexity and simplicity combination, as simple as getting what you're entitled to, apply, knowing what the rules are, applying, and then collectively advocating for this. And then the reverberations from that, how that could bankrupt the system, 
how it could cause people who are policymakers to have to rethink what they're doing. I don't know. I thought that was pretty revolutionary. But no, I agree. Thing- I agree. Those, that, those, the strategy and the means were revolutionary. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I was going to social work school at the time. And when I read uh, Regulating the Poor, I thought, wow, I can't believe. Because it's how they were seeing things. They were taking the same information. And and as they as Richard said in the interview, when you think of the classic textbooks on social welfare policy and how it's made and how people come to it, the way they they just looked at the same facts and completely saw a different pattern. Right. And that people people have to people get what they take. People have to advocate for that. As Richard often said, it's a jungle out there unless there are regulations and government steps in. But government will never do this unless it's forced to. And the power of the poor is the power to disrupt that system for these brief moments of time. Yeah. And where he runs into a lot of trouble, of course, with the establishment, social workers and uh, community organizers and so on and sociologists, is they want to organize, as he puts it, yeah. into mass organizations rather than mobilize. And, and that's where they really are clashing. No, no, no. You have this brief moment. Escalate the chaos, the disruption. Push for what you can get at the time. Um because you'll ne- you won't have it for very long. Then, and then the other side was saying, no, 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 no. We're going to organize mass organizations, and then uh, the energy, the spirit dissipates, and that's that. Um, yeah. You know, in, in one of the later interviews, I really was pushing the point you're making, Jim. Um, and um, and Richard was because he, I felt like Richard was saying just what you just said. You have to, you know, like these seams of history open up. You have to barrel through them, seize the moment, take advantage of them, and uh, don't spend a lot of time trying to build an organization. And then when these moments are not happening, building an organization, very often those organizations aren't the ones that uh, are ready and and take advantage of the next time a seam in history opens up. And as you said, these are very brief moments. But one of the things about Richard that, that, that struck me is, as I was listening to him, I said, it sounds like what you're saying is, you have to keep the pilot light burning, but that you can't ex- you can't try to have all the ranges on all the time uh, because that's expending energy and wasting fuel, and you don't know what you're going to need and when you're going to need it. The reason I brought that up is he, that was my metaphor. He then yeah. started using it in the interview over and over again, and yeah, he liked that. Yeah. And what I, and the thing that I wanted to what I think it says about Richard is he listened. He didn't just talk. He was always taking in what other people said. He would, anytime he saw me, he would always ask me, what's it like in the field right now? I was a community organizer. What's it like being a community organizer? And he would ask more and more questions. He didn't come in and start lecturing to me about, this is what you really should be doing, or this is what you really need to think about. Um, he was a great lecturer. And as he says in one of the interviews, he loved to lecture because he was such a clear thinker. And the other side of it, though, is he really did listen and he really could take other people's ideas and he could absorb them and incorporate them into his own thinking and then add to what he was saying in a way that people who he was involved with could understand what he was saying. Very down to earth. But as you point out, you asked him this question, what's the most difficult part of all this? He said his writing. Yeah. He, I mean, he, he really poured over. His writing it took him a long time correct and uh, he said that yes and 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 his feeling was that francis was much more of a natural writer and that caught me by surprise because you know i'd read everything richard and francis had written and what richard had written before them and i always thought of him as an excellent writer and he he was an excellent writer but it is and i don't know you know i write jim and and, and i don't find it comes that easily to me same so when here he said that i thought wow that's great to know yeah. um, that he had to struggle like this. I think he was also a bit of a perfectionist. He really wanted to be clear. And I don't know whether you're going to get into this or not, or whether I should talk about it now, but he talked about how he and Francis handled when they didn't necessarily d- agree right away on an idea when they were writing together. Please do that. Yeah, they, as they, you point out, they, they 
we're constantly talking to each other. And uh, I think you used the word impasse. Um, and he, and he, Richard was sort of cute on that. He said, did we really have impasses and so on? And Francis went on to more further explain that. So yeah, go ahead. How do they come to grips with some of the things maybe they had difficulty uh, working through? Or did they work it through or just let it be or whatever? Yeah. Well, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, like, I don't know about you. I don't have any colleagues that I don't have disagreements with sometimes intellectually, even if we're writing a book together or working on an article together. I think it's it's normal. It's natural. And Francis and, and Richard so much were working together and developing these really exciting theories and ideas at the same time. But anyway, Richard's response was, um, I, I, we really hardly ever disagree. Francis yeah. happened to be in the room and said, well, actually, we do disagree sometimes. And then they talked about it with each other. And what they came up with is, and Francis, I think, said this, if we disagree and we can't come to an agreement, then we just put it aside. We don't write about it. They only would write about what they both shared and agreed on. And I, again, I find that really incredible. I mean, in, in a way. Very healthy, it. Yeah. very healthy way of interacting as well. Uh, yeah. You know what I want to ask you because of a particular interest of my own. Uh, you mentioned in there that they never finished their work on the structuring perspective of deviant behavior, although they used ideas on it in their you know, analysis of social movements. Can you shed some light on that? Because I'm very, very interested in the social structuring of deviant behavior. I've written a couple articles myself on that and trying to figure out where he's going with that and the variables he tried to deal with and social ideas and social resources. And again, going back to his early work with the prison in the prison culture. So can you shed some light on, on that particular area, which seemed to be something they were very excited about, but as you point out, never really finished. No, it was really interesting to me because I, I, I felt, Jim, that Richard's work before he met Francis and then their work together, there was there was so much to say about deviant behavior and opportunity um, and how social structure shapes our behaviors, what we internalize, how we interact with one another, what's possible, what's not possible. But when I would talk to Richard, and especially in the first interview, he really said, I had this career as a criminologist. Right. And then when I went to mobilization for youth and I met Francis and we started working together, I left that behind. I moved on to looking at poverty, poor people's movements, power, vote, how to uh, how power can be exerted by poor people registering to vote. So in I don't know. I mean, just the way Richard would describe it to me or did describe it to me, it, it, he saw it almost as like a separate aspect of his work. And yet I agree with you, Jim. Uh, I, when I think about their work and it's influenced my work tremendously, I continually think about people can do what they can and can't do based on the historical realities, the social ecology, the structure that they inhabit. And that's not just outside of us. It's inside of us. It has to do with how people with power and privilege, like white people in the United States, don't see the water that they're swimming in all the time because the structures reinforce that, but it's also inside of people. It's part of what they see, what they don't see, how they operate, how they talk, what they think is important. So I think that, that Francis and Richard gave us lots of threads that we could yeah. pull on and then take further. Um, but in Richard's own mind, he didn't seem to see that as a prior career that he had moved on from. But again, bringing back some of those threads from the Chicago School in sociology um, to their structuring perspective, deviant behavior, and France is bringing some of the political science research on that and what rebellions and and you know and so on, insurrections might uh, be be called and, and incorporated into this larger theory of deviant behavior and the structuring of it, going back again to his ideas of the structuring of illegitimate opportunities within the prison setting, which is so crucial because prior to that, you know, most theorists and sociologists were constantly thinking that deviant behavior, criminal behavior is, is such a, it's a 
a world out there that's so different. It's not. And, it's not. and sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. You know, it's it's it, again within the social historical context of uh, and again Sutherland's insight of difference of group organization, understanding that his his book on illegitimacy uh, theory of illegitimate uh, 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 means and, and opportunities was not about opportunity so much, but understanding the illegitimate opportunity structure that deviants had and that how that funneled into a, the sort of lifestyle that they had, as you were talking about before. So the insight that then France is bringing in the political science aspect and, and just, it, it, as you say, these are such powerful threads that, that this generation, our, our generation and, and the next and, and, and subsequent ones have to have to piece together. Yeah, but, you know, it's really interesting because um, all that you're saying is true. And then what, what I can imagine Richard saying is who even defines what is deviant behavior? Right. I mean, when we start talking that way, we're already implicitly giving recognition to a group or a, a power structure that says this is legitimate, this is illegitimate. And I read a book by Philippe Bourgeois called In Search of Respect, which was about two young men who were dealing drugs in um, East Harlem. And what and it was really, I don't even remember if you referred to Richard's work and Richard and Francis's work, but he was exemplifying what you're saying, Jim, that they were businessmen. They were, they had uh, a way of making money. Uh, they ran a business. They respected themselves and one another. And that would have been considered deviant and illegitimate. And it would have been considered legitimate if they went into Wall Street or downtown New York and were working in offices and were not treated with respect um, and had to kind of fit in with white world and all and middle class world. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like there have been lots of people who have taken what some of the ideas that they started out with and have kind of given examples or done research or taken it further um, to exemplify what we're talking about. No, true. And also, uh, Francis, in her, I think it was the 1980 presidential um, address to the uh, study of society, uh, social problems, really points that out in her criticism of labeling theory. And what they miss is the social agency, the volition that human beings yes. have. And so I think Richard, again, would agree with that and and from subtle and social ideas social beliefs you need to find out what people are thinking and so on and i'm looking at the time we still have a few minutes but i you know i was so uh moved by so many things that you did questions you had here but toward the end of the i guess it's the second or third interview you ask um Thinking back to our early conversation today, where does that leave people who care about this, who want to go into ser uh, human services? And here's a typical Richard response. Well, I think the bitter truth is, and it is a bitter truth, that the reactionary periods are long and the progressive periods are brief. Yeah. We had this long reactionary period in the 1940s and 50s, McCarthyism and every other goddamn thing was going on. After four or five years of turbulence in the 30s, we had four or five years of turbulence in the 60s, and ever since it's been downhill. Well, that's the way it is. You can wish it were some other way, but if you look at history in the face, uh, in, the, uh, in the face, take off the goddamn rose-colored glasses off your eyes and look at history at, at, in just the way that it is. Every now and again, you get a chance to do something. That is what I always thought justified writing about disruption. Because these other approaches, when advances are made, are so goddamn brief. People come into them with preconceived notions about power, mass-based permanent organizations. They are uh, 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 ruining, they do not see the riots and the, and the understanding of that. Now, let me just skip down here uh, because this goes on. Uh, but he said, yes, it could be worse. Um it keeps the idea of justice alive so it's not altogether extinguished by ruling class propaganda. It provides a meaningful way to lead your life. You're identifying with issues of justice. You're identifying with oppressed groups. You must have that value orientation. Uh, it has to be in your soul. 
here he's maybe channeling, channeling his father. You had to get it from someplace. It has to be deeply imprinted on you so that even though you don't make it any make any particular progress, it is still meaningful to you to be identified with this cause. I have said that many times in class. I basically think the welfare state is based on the most important idea in history. That is the idea that the human community should be something more than a goddamn jungle, as you pointed out. Um, where the powerful prey on the weak. I think this is a powerful idea. I think it's the most powerful idea in history. In our, in our own bumbling, half-assed ways, social workers identified with their idea. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah, look at that. Yeah, what can you say? And, and you elicited this. You got this. You, you, there's so many wonderful um, insights that you were able to garner from these interviews. And I, I, I speak for so many people. Thank you so very, very much for this. Well, Jim, thank you for reading in the, the interviews and for what you've said about them and giving me the chance to reread them and think about them. I just want to, and I know we're running out of time. A couple of minutes. Okay. When it comes to people who are going into community organizing and social work and related fields, Richard was a pragmatist in my view. He was incredibly honest. He and sometimes would, he'd say, I don't know what I've accomplished. Or as you said, the, the periods of reactionary politics are so much bigger than progressive times. And I think what he would say is you can't, you can't make a mass movement happen. Like what happened um, during the summer when there were uprisings in the United States, that happens. The fire gets lit and, it, and it, take, it takes off. You as a community organizer can't do that, certainly on a national level. It has to be the right moment, the right set of uh, conditions. But two things, you can keep justice alive, as you just said. And the other thing is on a local level, actually, I think you can catch fire. So that even if in the big picture, this is a really reactionary period and we're not getting a lot of things done, locally, we can take what Richard and Francis taught us and try to use that to um, make radical change at the local level. But two last things, listen to people who are directly experiencing social exclusion, marginalization, and oppression. Don't go in with your assumptions, your preconceptions, you, what you think people need, what you see, how you describe it. You need to listen to the people who are experiencing it. And also I would add to that, they need to be taking leadership. You should be taking a backseat role, a supportive role. Um, Richard didn't explicitly say that, but I take that um, from what I heard from him. The last thing I want to say is I did these interviews with Richard 21 years ago. I was in my 50s. He was 73, I think. I'm 73 now. It's really incredible for me to think back on how I felt then and what a profound impact he's had on my career. Um, and I'm the same age he was when he died. And I, um, I'm just so grateful for him, for Francis, for the work they did, um, to have had the privilege to have those kind of intimate conversations that we had together. Um, it will always be one of the most special things that I've had access to and done in my life. So well put. I, I feel what you're saying. And let's go out on this note. It, from your introduction here. I was very influenced by his ideas, inspired by his passion, social political commitments. Like many of the contributors to, to, the, uh, to the Reflections book, I have many powerful memories. One that stands out for me is when I was 15, okay, um, and lived in Yonkers, New York, and needed a ride into the city. Richard picked me up in a silver sports car on Tuckahoe Road, and after exchanging hellos we drove in complete silence silence to manhattan for a sullen teenager it was a moment of unusual comfort and surprising pleasure no obligation to make small talk just two cool guys cruising the henry hudson parkway watching the city pass by forever young it doesn't get bad any better than that okay <laughs> you're still that cool 15 year old okay and I'm your age too. And so we're over time. God bless you. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, Jim. Let's see. Maybe we'll get Francis. We'll do another one. But I'd love to. Heartfelt thank you 
And I know Richard and Francis, thank you so much too. All the best. Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate it. We'll Take care. And thank you so very, very much. This is Jim Brothers with Radical Imagination. See you next week on The Radical Imagination. Don't you know they're talking about a revolution? Sounds like a whisper. Standing on the welfare lines Crying at the doorsteps of those armies of salvation Wasting time in the unemployment lines Sitting around waiting for a promotion Don't you know Talking about a revolution Sounds like a whisper Don't you know Talking about a revolution. Don't you know you better run, 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 while they're standing in the welfare lines, crying at the doorsteps of those armies.